Long Run Archives number 16, joined by frequent colleagues and friends, Brett Hornig and Leah Yingling. This episode's going to be really all about further, not just the athlete side, but also like the crew experience, the media experience, the before, during, after. I think a lot of people like myself, we followed along via our friend Mike's photojournalism throughout the week. Uh, I think Outside had an article. Iron Far had an article. Um, there was a tracker, which I was feverishly refreshing, but I think a lot of people, myself included, are looking forward to this conversation, this debrief. Um, Leah, I guess the first question I have for you, because you you are a veteran of this sport, you've done a lot of the most interesting races in our sport. How do you feel post further versus post whatever was the most difficult or significant thing you had done before this event? I feel shockingly like normal, which was <laughs> never what I would have anticipated saying if you were to ask me a couple weeks ago how I would feel. Um, this has been a really interesting recovery so far, uh, very different from any recovery I've had in the past. I feel extremely muscularly intact, and I have uh, some reasons why I think this. Um, if anything, my joints are slightly cranky compared to how they've been in the past, so knees mostly. And then um, some tendons, just a little bit peskier than normal. So mostly like knee tendons and Achilles. But in terms of muscles, I have not had a single sore quad, hamstring, calf since finishing the event. And it's boggling to me. And I, I would love to know why, but I'm going to just enjoy it. <laughs> and this is actually something Brett and I have talked about, like one of our favorite moments in ultra running history was uh hal kerner's uh jmt fkt attempt back in like 2012 um another one that comes to mind for me is like scott jurek's appalachian trail and the reason i bring those two up is because it seems to me when you when you think about the multi-day category it's either this swan song career ender or like you've just said it can be this experience which was like not as taxing as you thought it might be and there's still like plenty more runway of excellence. Uh, what do you attribute like the, the good feelings to? A few things. I think with further, as a lot of people who have been following along so far have noticed, is it was an extremely well-supported event. That was one thing that they were going for, is to see how far women could go when they are well-supported. And well-supported from a variety of avenues. One of these is medical. One of these is nutrition. Another one is like mental performance coaching. Uh, I have some other interesting things that I was able to tap into out there as well that we can chat about a little bit later on, but like as much as down to biomechanics. So I had a lot of opportunities out there to glean what I could from resources throughout the event. And I'm somebody that is willing to do that in an event if it means optimizing my performance and maintaining my health throughout. Um, so. I also think something that could lend itself to feeling the way I do right now too is pacing, how I pace the event, and then also how I fueled the event. Uh, learned so much, so much. And like I consider myself a veteran of the sport. And I even told the Canadian Sport Institute nutritionist going into the event that like I didn't need her help because I was pretty good. I had a solid nutrition plan and I was pretty confident in that. But I think I gained so much in terms of knowledge from troubleshooting in this event more so than I ever have before. So yeah, lifelong learner over here. I never know everything. And I think each race is showing me that even more and more. I took a couple notes here to come back to later in the conversation. I got to check in with our friend Brett too, because from what I gather, crewing for these events is also like a full contact sport. And there is probably some recovery after bacon after the fact, but Right, you look pretty you look pretty damn good. How are you doing right now? I mean, I've gotten I've gotten two nights of sleep that actually happened at night. Um my sleep numbers are still trash. Uh my my HRV's all over the place. I'm either like right on the verge of getting sick or I'm just at rock bottom and we're climbing out of it. But uh feel pretty good. It it was definitely an experience to one just crew and like be ready to crew for you know basically essentially it was like every 26 minutes and 30 seconds we would expect leah to come in 
on a lap, which it really doesn't leave that much time in between. Um, so it's like once Leah would leave, we would get some stuff prepped for the next lap, you know, maybe run down to the, the nutrition store if we needed to grab some more things, figure out how far away Leah was from either like a 15 minute break or a more major rest. Um, and then by the time we kind of like did those things, we we're like, okay, she's going to be here in five minutes. Um, okay, let's start, let's start prepping again. And then it was kind of rinse and repeat for like six days. Uh, and it, you know, definitely evolved over the course of it. And it like, it changed between like, whether it was daytime or nighttime, we kind of found a little bit of a rhythm, but, um, yeah, I think as a crew crew, like we thought there would be more downtime than there was, you know, like Caleb's texting me like the day before he's like, Hey, do you think one of these days you want to run up to the Mount Jacinto? And I was like, I highly doubt that's going to happen, but okay. Like he was thinking, you know, there might be like a full 24 hours where we're not tired to just go for a big long run. And it was like, it just, it ended up being, uh, too, too constant, which, which is a good thing. Yeah. I think one of my favorite moments was I ended up being a complete night owl through most of the event. So I would do the large majority of my running at night and I'd come into the aid station. And I'd be like, guys, I'm just vibing right now. I'm having such a nice time just getting in flow state out there. And Brent was like, that's funny because we have yet to reach flow state here in the aid station. So you're living your best life out there. Yeah. The, um, the crew, me and me and Mike were talking about that. We were like, who do you think would do better on a cognitive test right now? And this was, you know, at the end of the sixth day, like, do you think it would be Leah or it would be us? Like on paper, it should be us, but Leah got to, you know, only worry about, you know, running essentially for six days and like get in that flow state and like click off the laps. And like, you know, you had a whole bunch of various milestones and checkpoints over the course of each lap. Um, and we were like, wow, aside from the fact that she's been running for six days, we're like, that sounds like nice in ways. Whereas, yeah, we haven't done anything rhythmic and like flow steady, and I think that might be why our 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 bodies were fine, but our minds were just absolutely trashed at the end. Like it was comical, like trying to have conversations. All right, you mentioned the cognitive tests, and this is something I heard secondhand. It could be wrong, but the information that I received was that the Lululemon team was somewhat shocked by the results of the cognitive test. That like you guys weren't like Leah, you weren't that far off pre-event baseline at the end of this? Yeah. So we performed um, a few different cognitive tests, pre-event, um, middle of the event on each day if we opted into that. Um, and then everybody completed them post-event. And based on my just own recollection and like knowledge of how I did on these tests, um, I'm pretty sure I performed better at the end. And I heard similar reports from um, the athletes who completed them during the event themselves. Um, I didn't end up completing any during the event because they're pretty time consuming. They took about 20 minutes to do. Um, but for some of the athletes that did, they're performing better in the middle of the event, perhaps on day three, day four, than they were before the event. And just hypothesizing based on research, I think a lot of that could be due to similar to that flow state that we're talking about and just like how cognitive you are when you're focused on a goal mid event. Um, and I like to say like, probably really highly like glucosed up, caffeinated up, like targeted. Okay. Whereas in the day before the event, we're pretty stressed. We're thinking about the event itself and probably not all mentally there because you've got tons of things on your mind. So I'm really excited to see the results of that research because I think um, just firsthand gleaning from some of the conversations, uh, a little bit counterintuitive of what you'd expect. Yeah, that's wild. Um, super wild. Brett, uh, one, one more question I want to ask you. Did you have any, like, and I'm sure there was a lot of, you know, learnings, but did you have preconceptions about what a multi-day event was going to look and feel like versus what it was actually like on the ground and kind of how you interpret it now? So, I mean, kind of like everyone else in the public world, I had no idea what the venue or anything was going to look like. I mean, Leah, you didn't even know what it was going to look like until the morning of, right? Like, like we had yeah, a I had never they, we had yeah. like a little map with like, it's like with little squares that said, this is what it's going to be like, but that was it. So then from a crewing perspective, I, I, I had nothing to picture and all I was prepared for was, a, you know, 
a, lo a lot of sleepless nights. Like that was pretty much the only thing that I spent any sort of mental energy, like wrapping my head around was like, okay, like my sleep schedule might flip flop sometimes. And then especially during our crew meeting the day before the race, when we slowly worked the schedule to a way where there was a scenario where like, okay, over the course of the first 24 hours, Leah gets to a spot where she can then sleep to during the day on day two and when we'll stay on more of a night schedule and i was like oh and then it was like okay by show of hands who wants to work the night shifts and then it was like mike was like well i'm gonna be there the whole time and then peter was like well i'm gonna be there the whole time too and i was like well then that's only two of them if one of them falls asleep that means we're just relying on the other person to stay awake i was like okay i'll, I'll, I'll be the third person and then i, th I think having three did bring a lot of peace of mind to us as a crew, hopefully mm -hmm. to you as well, Leah, yeah. that like then one person could actually get to sleep and like full well know that we weren't going to sleep through Leah coming in and having to wake us up because I feel like that would have been mildly disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it's interesting to talk a little bit too about like the setup of like what that entailed. So we had, it was like a, Two, roughly two and a half mile loop course, 2.54 XXX. Five, six. Um, five, six. 2.568. <laughs> yes. Um, which is actually really important uh, because yeah. that adds up. <laughs> and so we had our line of crew tents that was right by the start finish area um, that you would either stay on course each lap and not hit your crew spot, or you could kind of come right outside the gate, pass your crew, get back right back on course um, on a specific lap if you did want to visit your crew. Um, there was a cot in there if you wanted to take like small naps, um, but if you wanted to take a bigger sleep, which some of the athletes who were targeting more like distance-based goals each day, like 50K a day, 50 miles a day, um, they had very much programmed sleep for themselves and would get like kind of like a normal night dinner, normal night sleep. They would stay up in the RVs then, which was what we were calling Athlete Village, which was about a tenth of a mile along the loop as well. Um, you'd have to exit the course there and then you'd get on a little golf cart and it would take you to your RV. And then the next morning, whenever you got back on course, you'd take your golf cart back to where you exited the course, hop back, hop back on there and then finish your loop. So it kind of, you had to be a little mindful of like, if I am taking a nap, if I am taking a sleep, where am I doing that at? Um, yeah. The RV is really uh, luxurious compared to like our little crew room. So you knew if you were going up in that direction that like, you were going to probably take a couple hour nap in that case rather than uh, on the cot where that'd be more like a 15 to 30 minute nap mm -hmm. yeah it was very much i mean there definitely was had to have been f1 influence in it because the pit stop very much was the pit stop of an f1 course where you like go slightly of course parallel it you have your like you had your garage where we had everything mm -hmm. necessary to fix your car <laughs> but then like all F1 courses slightly off the course have the athlete village where they have the big trailers and et cetera. And like, that's exactly how this was designed. Um, and it was, it was, I mean, that we were all pretty confused about how it worked at first initially with like, where can we take Leah in a golf car? Where can we not? How does she enter the course, exit the course? Because we just needed to be there to see it and kind of get that run through, which, uh, you know, the first day, we knew it was like, like the first day we were like, it's probably going to be the easiest day. Like we're all the freshest. Leah's the freshest. We got to use this day to like figure out how everything works and like find our rhythm. Um, and yeah, kind of going back to your original question, Finn, like the, like those were things that we couldn't really like mentally prep for or visualize. We just had to like, be like, we will wait until we get there. We have, six days even if we have to figure this out in the first day it's still one whole day we will figure it yeah. out and i will say like that was not the plan uh palm springs got slammed with windstorm oh, right. in the few days leading up to the event um so much so that at least through me Devin, and steph like all of our flights into palm springs the night we were supposed to arrive all got diverted and I remember that. they ended up having to fly into lax I ended up not even getting being able to take my flight and having to come home and fly out the next day um, because all flights were not being allowed to land in Palm Springs. Um, so these winds were like tornado like really. And 
I believe they had had a large portion of the course set up. And when these winds came through, it just demolished pretty much everything um, from the athlete crew tents to the biomechanics tent. So a lot of work that they'd been putting in all week, a lot of the plan that we had planned to follow, like athletes getting to visit the course a few days prior, um, that wasn't able to happen, which honestly, it wasn't a big deal. Like I was going to spend six days out there anyhow, totally okay. And I trusted my crew entirely. Um, we were given the option the day before to go visit the course. Um, but me and a couple others were like, eh, it's fine at this point. It is what it is. It's a flat two and a half ish mile loop and we'll figure it out when we get out there. So it definitely posed its challenges. Um, but at the same time, I feel like we had enough time out there to figure it out once the event actually got started. Yeah. That is one thing that was actually really amazing was like the entire venue basically got destroyed the Saturday before the race and the, the crew that like Lulu lemon themselves, like all the employees there, they had to do a huge amount of work. The setup crews that they hired out had to do a massive amount of work to, they had to re, uh, they had to basically fix the whole course because so much dust and sand got moved onto the course that they had to like rebuild the loop and um, re barricade it because those all got moved. And then they had to remeasure it, recertify it through world athletics and like get the distance officially changed. And this was between Saturday and then when did the race start? Wednesday morning. morning um, yeah. Like, I don't think anyone, like anyone from like behind the scenes slept for four days and I hope that, you know, I hope more people get to like learn that story and the amount of appreciation that they have. Cause even the night before the race, when the crews, like we got to go to see the course, um, on Tuesday night and they were kind of giving us a rundown, like a little tour of like, okay, this is, this is what's what. And like Leah's crew pit stop garage was, you know, all set up and ready to go we didn't know that that was actually the only one that was set up and they were using that as like the example. And like the other nine were still empty, um, you know, 15 hours before the start of the race. And they worked all night to get every single one of them set up and like perfectly ready to go. Leah, two things I'd love to hear you talk about. One was recounting the moment when you first heard of this idea and sort of what your reaction was like. And then two, how you and your coach Megan uh, were just going to like, work backward from the day like the event started and train for it yeah it's pretty funny just to think about the trajectory since i learned about it so in january december january of last year so um uh, january 2023 the idea that lululemon was putting on a really big event of this kind was put on my radar at that time it had a different name and a little bit of a different scope the initial goal for the event was somewhere in the 24 to 48 hour range, which at that time I was like, all right, I can get on board with that. That's like still within my wheelhouse, but would challenge me in such a way that it's not entirely out of scope of what I think I'm capable of. So I was like, all right, we got this. Um, a couple months later, probably around like March, April of last year, the event had fully taken form. And it was now a six day event, which is pretty different, um, especially for somebody who has never had any intentions of completing a six day event. It's never been anything that's been on my radar. So it was slightly shocking and scary and very difficult to wrap my mind around, especially given the nature of the season that I was planning for myself last year, which was largely based around Western States and UTMB mm. and being somebody that always advocates for ample recovery, doing what's smart, doing what's best for my body, listening to myself, and then also being a full-time working professional, trying to balance all those things. So I think for me, it was a bit scary at first because how the heck do you train for a six day event? Um, how do I train for a six day event while also working? And how do I train for a six day and execute a six day event while staying healthy? Um, those were all questions I was asking myself and to be honest, and you can fact check this with Megan. These were questions I was asking myself probably about two months ago as well. Uh, I had pivoted to this idea of targeting a 24 hour goal, um, probably back in after ultra Child Cape town kind of went a little South for me. I just 
kind of rebalanced myself and thought yeah. about what I wanted to get out of further and was like, okay, let's target a 24 hour time and then a 24 hour goal. And let's see what I've got for the remaining days and kind of maybe use those days to support my other um, fellow athlete competitors out there, which sounded really nice because it was a competitive goal. It was standardized. There's a lot of women internationally and nationally who have targeted 24 hours. So I felt like I had good metrics to weigh my success against. Um, but then it also allowed for me to celebrate the others that I was up against. Uh, come probably February, uh, after having a few conversations, I got motivated to put myself in it a little bit more for the full six days. And after a conversation with Megan, we were just like, all right, let's see what I can do if I'm competitive for six days, but I don't kill myself for six days. Like, what does that look like? What is something that's sustainable, maintainable, and will keep me happy and healthy? And what we arrived at was this kind of like arbitrary goal of averaging around 80 plus miles a day. So 80 as like the target, 80 to 90, um, see where that would land me. If the four day, five day and six day women's world records all average around 90 to 93 miles a day. Um, so where I arrived at leading up to the event was like seeing if targeting 350 Ks a day was reasonable. Uh, however, not holding myself to that and seeing if I needed to adapt, I would adapt. Um, so the goal the night before the race and what I was telling my crew then <laughs> was we're going to try to do 350 Ks a day, keep those 50 Ks in five and a half hour windows, see how long we can do this. If it doesn't work because who the heck even knows if this is feasible, let's adapt on the fly and figure it out. And that's what we did. I mean, one, one thing from that, that I want to hone in on, cause and probably to get a little selfish here for a second, although this has been a benefit to conversational pace in terms of reviewing shoes, I'm doing Coca Dona in May. <laughs> and my first reaction after signing up was just this like feeling of insecurity where if I want to be ready for the event, I have to just go absolute batshit crazy on mileage. And so, yeah, the last like two and a half months I've been running more volume than I've ever run before, but then I saw your training for this and you kind of just stuck to what's worked for you in the past, nothing crazy, and you put out a great performance. So uh, say more about that because I, I might uh, feel uh, emboldened to reduce my mileage after yeah. uh, watching this. I, I think if anybody talked to me, went for a run with me leading up to the event, when they'd asked me about the six days, I would say like this event is kind of the antithesis of who I am as a runner. Like I find the most joy in the mountains. My favorite training day for this event was doing the Rufa six hour here in our backyard where I ended up with like 26 miles and 10,000 plus feet of climbing over the course of a little less than six hours. So that's the type of training that usually brings me joy. And after talking to Megan, as we were catering to this training, she knew and I knew that I didn't want to lose my joy in training because if I lose my joy in training, it seems like a task. It seems like a lot of work. It's really hard for me to get out the door after a day of work to do training that's not exciting me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to happen because I wanted to show up at further, like mentally rested and ready to take on whatever that challenge looked like. So I was actually a little nervous about my training. I'm not going to lie. Like this was some of my lowest training. And this was not by nature of Megan's training that she gave me or anything like that. It was a nature of just life busyness and yeah. the training that I was able to complete. Like usually Megan and I do about six days of running a week. Some of those days are doubles. Um, and I pulled the plug on like a couple of those runs here and there to the point where I think I averaged about eight and a half hours a week of running leading up to the event, which is some of my lowest mileage. Like Western States, I'm usually between like 10 and 13 hours a week, UTMB, probably about between 12 and 15 hours a week. So th this was some of my lowest ever, which was a little bit terrifying. Uh, but I think with the strategy that we ended up implementing, it worked totally fine for me. And the fact that my muscles feel as great as they do right now, I don't know what the heck that I, I did, but I'm very happy with how I approach training and then also like executing the event itself. Brett, I, I wanted to ask you some crew questions, but if you were to put your coaching hat on for a second, would you, is there anything you would uh, want to add to that? I think one of the biggest takeaways that I got from this is 
Not that this wasn't a massive physical challenge, but the mental side of things was even greater, you know, of an edge that someone could have uh, than I initially thought. Um, you know, it, and I guess we just really don't get to see this in very many race scenarios, like really ever, where someone might run for 20 hours sleep for six and then get going again. Like you see it a little bit for these like 200, 250 mile races, but they're usually done after three days. That's like, we're only halfway for further. Like we are still three more days. So it was very interesting to see, um, you know, like kind of like the whole like motion is lotion type theory where um, it seemed like even after the second day, like people get out of the RVs, they take their coffee lap. Um, you just walk a lap and sip on your coffee, enjoy some sunshine. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, my body doesn't feel like terrible anymore. And then like, there was a lot of uplifting energy out there. Um, that was one thing that I think Lulu did a great job of, whether that was, I mean, it was the athletes and who was, who was participating as well as the crews. And then also just the personnel that were there. Um, it was like really good vibes all around. And I think because it was, you know, just a two and a half mile loop, you don't have a lot of time to get into a bad headspace before all of a sudden you're like dancing around again, like, oh, I forgot how much this sucked. It actually doesn't. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then when the mind stays in that spot, the body seemed to really follow, you know, I mean, from a crew standpoint, you know, it, it felt like, like, you're, I think, I don't know, let me know what you think, but I feel like your second day was probably the worst of six days from like a physical standpoint. Like it seemed like everything was falling apart on the second day. <laughs> but then um, again, with the troubleshooting and like you making the conscious decision to like, you know, have to pivot if we need to, we'll try some different things, you know, like there's still time things somehow then turned around. Like, you know, you mentioned your like, calf being sore the most on day two. And then by six day, I like, asked you again, I was like, how's your calf? And you're like, huh, I haven't thought about it in 145 miles. <laughs> and I thought that was just so fascinating how I was kind of always under the impression that if it's like something started to go downhill early on, it was really only just going to get worse. Um, but I saw the opposite happen with almost everybody out there. And that was just so fascinating. So, you know, going back to what Lucy, like going in mentally fresh and just like being okay with like tackling that sort of challenge and making sure that you have like the mental capacity to do that, like might outweigh any sort of training that you try and squeeze in. Totally. And something that I've thought a lot about since the event is like, the, one of the most shocking things to me about myself was my mental capacity and my mental freshness the entire time and like my willingness to get back out there. So anybody that's close to me, especially Mike, can tell you getting me out for a run 95% of the time is like pulling teeth. And I'm laying on the couch and he's like, let's go out for a run. I'm like, no, 30 more minutes. <laughs> and it's that rinse and repeat. So I'm like a bear when it comes to getting out for runs. But for whatever reason here, and I think I attribute it a lot to my incredible crew and just the energy that they brought. Uh, it was actually quite easy, way easier than I anticipated. And it was just amazing how willing I was to get back out there. And mm -hmm. like Brett said, after I would take like some of the structure we would have is I would do like 12 laps, which was roughly a 50 K. Um, and then I would take like a good 20 to 30 minute like nutrition break where I ate a lot of pierogies. I ate some smooth, drank some smoothie. I would um, drink a protein shake and then I'd get back out there. And every time after one of those 50 K chunks, I would tell my crew like, all right, guys, this is going to be one of my slowest laps. So like, don't get nervous if you don't see me because it just felt like it was about to be this like big digestion lap. Mm. And then I can't tell you how many times I came whipping around that lap and they're like, what the heck are you doing? Why was that your fastest lap so far? So huh. that was shocking and I can't explain it, but it happened so many times. Mm. Under promise over deliver. Yeah, maybe that's what I do. <laughs> um, 
Brett, I'm sure there are some people out there that are, well, we've, we've used the word F1 a couple of times in this conversation. And obviously like in ultras crewing is such a vital part of an athlete's success. Um, also we got to give a shout out to Caleb Morgan, Mike, you, Anna, uh, Peter, the, the entire team for the six days of incredible selfless work. But, uh, and Susie, can't forget Susie. Susie. Sorry, and Su- sorry. <laughs> of course, probably the most important, Susie. Um, what were some of the lessons? Like if you could impart some wisdom to crews at future races about what works and um, what's state of the art, what'd you, what'd you pick up? For six days, at least, I'm actually very glad that we had one person who was able to bring that mom energy. <laughs> um, like we, we, we like kind of all needed a mom even after like the first day and like, yeah, like it, it, every morning Susie would drive over from the hotel and the first thing that she would do is make fun of me, Peter and Mike and how messy we got the, the, the crew garage. And she's like, I don't understand how you guys can turn this place into such a pigsty, but then just would immediately <laughs> go, would just immediately go into like tidying it up, like making sure all the clothes were in the correct order and like refolding the blankets and like, she was so crucial to the the daily reset Mm -hmm. so that way we could then go and destroy everything again um but that that ended up like you know it's it's like taking a shower in the morning you're like oh i'm awake now it's like and then leah gets to come in a lap and then all of a sudden her room is nice and clean again and like freaking it got it got vacuumed she vacuumed like who who vacuums during a race it was amazing um didn't i didn't realize how how helpful that would be and not just from like a cleanliness standpoint from like a fresh energy standpoint i can't agree more with that that didn't even cross my mind like obviously i invited my mom from day one but the we did a lot of resetting throughout the event so whether that was brushing my teeth using mouthwash mouthwash washing my face putting moisturizer on like having morgan braid my hair in the morning taking a shower if I needed to, um, those things to like physically reset. But that is a great point that having somebody to like reset your space was extremely vital and something that was going on in the background at all times that like I did, I didn't really even notice in the moment, but it was probably extremely mentally valuable for me. So I'm not just, we called our night crew, like tall, dark and handsome. And so the Paul Dark and Handsome crew, whenever they'd get off night shift, that place was like a disaster. So my mom was just like paramount in keeping that, like mm. just resetting that every morning, which was just awesome. <laughs> and um, and all the pictures she brought. Oh, oh yeah, that was okay. So I worked with. Yeah, uh, we need to talk about that. Yeah, this was really special for me, um, and I have a lot of feelings on this topic. Um, I worked with the mental performance coach going into the event. And one of the biggest things I was nervous about is I'm inherently an introvert, but I'm a social being that's also an introvert. So every day I FaceTime my nieces and nephews. I talk to my mom on the phone most days, talk to my twin sister on the phone most days and like just engaging with my friends and family and Mike and things like that. I told the mental performance coach that one of the things I was most fearful of was just that fear of missing out and not being a part of something and just miss, missing that like connection and that those social mm-hmm. moments. Um, so one of the things she recommended I do was dedicate a lap to a person, things like that, or just have Mike recount the days with me. Um, something that I asked my mom to do going into this event was to fill my space with pictures of like all of my family that I love, all of like my motivating moments in ultra running. So my doors were just filled with my nephews and niece and my sisters and like moments from Western States, UTMB. So I feel like even like in the morning when I was like looking in the mirror or something, fixing something to get ready to go out, I was just filled by positive moments and it was exceptional and just kept me in a positive headspace the entire time, just unknowingly. So that was, that was a huge takeaway for me. It was just like those little like social elements. Um, and something I did throughout the event as well was um, had like my daily FaceTimes with my nephews and nieces. And I think anybody out there like watching with a critical eye in terms of performance, they're like, oh my God, that's time wasted. But in my eyes, it was just time that I didn't want to give back because that it was my time. That's what filled me up. And that's what was like powering me whenever I was out there on the loops, which was really special. 
it makes me wonder if you could condense that down to a shorter distance and bring like photo boards and stuff to the aid stations at Run Rabbit Run in Western states, and it would have a, a similar effect in a in a more consolidated period of time. Totally. And like I think Finn, you can speak to this as well, but you FaceTimed me with Lupin, our cat at mile 350 and I was like in a pretty low spot and excited to celebrate a milestone and just that was like the FaceTime I didn't know I needed which was my cat so like little moments like that that just give you that energy to propel you forward for maybe it's only another 10 miles but it was 10 miles that was going to be mentally challenging to do and now it was just made easier so those little little strategies that I thought would be like minuscule ended up just being completely huge for me. Yeah, for listeners of the pod, we have this Salt Lake City-based group chat called Cat Nation, and it's uh, (laughs) the members are at the confluence of lovers of trail running. They're based in Salt Lake City, and they also have cats. And my wife, Jules, and I were refreshing the tracker the whole week, and Leah is approaching mile 350, and Jules like asks aloud, she's like, if I was 350 miles into a race, what would I want? And Jules loves cats. She's like, I would want to talk with my cat. And so she's like, Finn, we're driving over to Mike and Leah's house. We're entering the door code, we're walking in, we're uh, getting loop in. And then as soon as Leah finishes her next lap, we're, we're FaceTiming her in. So and Lupin was engaging. She was engaging. She, she knew her mommy and she was happy. <laughs> um, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, okay. I've got a couple topics here. Like we've got like the gear and the testing that was involved. I'm really interested in a lot of the people like uh, Trent Stallingworth, really interested in hearing more about. Uh, maybe we can do the multi-day strategy first though. And I think the first thing I want to talk about is sleep because Mm -hmm. as I've been getting ready for Cocodona, one of the things that I've heard with sleep is like, you want to have it in these like short bouts and you don't want to go above like 60 to 90 minutes, because if you do, your body starts to think it's like in recovery mode and like the event or whatever you're doing is like over, Mm -hmm. but it seems like you were able to sleep for longer bouts and still kind of like be in it and you know, Brett said motion is lotion. So talk about what you learned first about sleep. Oh, so much, so much. Uh, so the first day, I'll just kind of go through each day and what that looked like and where we implemented sleep. Um, because this was something I thought about, but I had really no specific plan for it. So on day one, the plan was to run for 24 hours, um, to get myself on a sleep schedule that was during the hottest hours of the day. Um, the event started at 9 a.m., and I ran until 9 a.m. the next day. And my sleep, I took no sleep during that period, but I did take like a one and a half hour um, reset around midnight to 1.30, let's say, um, where I was hoping to sleep, but then it just ended up turning into like a chill and hang out with friends period of time. That was just like more of a mental reset than anything. Um, Up until that point, the only, I was doing like 50K and would take, a 30 minute, 20 to 30 minute, like nutrition reset, another 50 K 20 to 30 minute nutrition reset. I did that all the way through 24 hours. Um, and then around, I think 26 hours in around 11 AM is when I took my first like bigger sleep. And my goal for this was to then sleep from like 11 AM till about three or 4 PM. So get about four hours, five hours. I think at the end of the day, it ended up actually only being like three hours of sleep, if that, in that period, maybe two and a half hours. Um, But regardless, I was resting. So I was happy. As long as I was like laying in bed, being restful, I was happy. Um, And then I got back out there on day two. And then I wanted to write here. I think I did 115 miles on day one, about 76 miles on day two. Um, So by the end of day two, I had done about 191 miles. Um, And I actually thought like how we were structuring sleep up till that point was really good. I would take like a three to four hour chunk and then go through for another 24 hours, but being mindful if I needed to take any extra sleeps, which that started to be the case kind of going into day three is when I started to be like, okay, guys, I think I need to take a 30 minute snooze right now and just being open to pivoting in that way if I needed to. Um, I was amazed by how long I could go. So by the end of, I think on day three, then I ran about a hundred K, um, I was amazed that I was able to do, you know, upwards of 250, 260 miles on maybe a cumulative six hours of sleep total. Um, And that was shocking. Like, I think those two hour blocks, two hours, two to three hour blocks were 
super sufficient. I think if I were doing an event that was less than six days, you'd be able to get by with a lot less. That was something that I was thinking a lot about is just like the perspective I gained through six day event. Like, I think I had Mike text Jamil on like day four that was like, sign me up for Cocodona next year. Uh, because it was like, it just sounded easy at that point. So I think perspective on sleep was something I definitely gained. Like, I think for an event like Cocodona, like one hour, two hour chunks of sleep would be totally sufficient in my eyes. Wow. Yeah. From my point of view, you got better at sleeping, uh, over the course of the event. Like, yeah. yeah like, you know, like you were the first, you know, after it was like 18 hours when you took your first, like, you know, 90 minute, two hour rest that was supposed to be sleep. But I think your body was still just going in like overdrive mode where it was like, you know, my resting heart rate's like a hundred right now. Like I'm not yeah. sleeping. Um, and then like second night was when I think your body, like you were able to finally convince your body that this was the new norm mm -hmm. and that it's going to be okay. And that, you know, that was the big reset. I've got your, um, the Leah race plan up right now. So I'm looking through, uh, the, the, the splits and it was like, yeah, from like two, 2 AM to 5 AM on the second night. That was, that was the one where, where it was like, <laughs> the, that was when the crew was probably the most worried. Um, but then, then after that, your body kind of started to accept that this was the new normal. And then after that, it was like, when you were coming in, you're like, okay, I'm going to take a 60 minute snooze. You know, you spend like 15 minutes, like changing your clothes, getting some food in. And then you're like, okay, set my alarm for an hour. And after like maybe day three onwards to the finish, like as soon as you put your head down, you were out for like 58 minutes. Whereas <laughs> the first, the first two nights or days, that was not the case at all. It was like, you know, it would take like you know, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of just like lying there. And then you're like, well, it's not happening. I'm just gonna start running again. Um, so that, that was really interesting to see uh, just these adaptations that like, you just like, don't know if they're ever gonna happen until you experience them. And then it was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. Cause I actually felt like sleep other than like, I would have loved to sleep in those moments of just being restful on day one to two or whatever. Um, sleep was never my issue really ever. It was more mm -hmm. like potential injuries and like concerning medical things that were my issues. Like I was looking back and I was like, Oh, why was day three? Like only, only like a hundred K. Um, and I think a lot of that was due to, we had a lot of medical things we were managing that day. Like I had, I, my, I had pretty, my blisters were pretty bad after, um, my first like day and a half of running. So, um, this was really cool. And we can get into this a little bit more was just how yeah. available the medical team was. Um, so I think it was between after my first big sleep. Um, so at this point I had run probably somewhere around 150 miles or so. Um, I told the medical team who was comprised of like Andy Pasternak, who's like the medical director for Western States, Emily Krause from Stanford. Um, and then Megan Roach was out there as a medical advisor as well. And Maddie Giegold, who's a physician um, working in Reno, I told them like I was going to need my like blisters like professionally managed, and I'm sleeping that morning from in my or I guess that afternoon, and that whole team is in my RV within minutes taping my toes, and that was something like UTMB was the first race this year where I've ever had foot issues where I'm like okay your feet can actually be a major issue in races and I need to be more mindful of getting ahead of this, um, in races in the future. Uh, I think on day one and day two of further, I was like really over electrolyted at times. So I was holding on to a lot of fluid. Um, I ended up bumping up a size in my shoe, a half size in my shoes, which was totally the move and made the rest of my days just so comfortable. But the fact that I could get a full medical team in my RV within minutes to tape my toes, like, and just change the game for me was exceptional. Same with, uh, like knee tendonitis that was starting to crop up on day two into three, they came in there and like taped my knee up as well. And like Brett said, by day six, knee was fine. Toes were amazing. Like just a lesson in staying on top of the little things before they become big things. I've never been taught a more, like a better lesson actively in a race than at further. How much did the wearables that you were monitoring inform your moment by moment decision? So like your Ura ring, 
glucose monitors, yeah, core temp stuff. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, all of it was so cool. So yeah, we had a core temperature monitoring pill several throughout the week that we would consume, and the research team had their eyes actively on this. And Brett can talk to a pretty cool experience that he had yeah. regarding this. Um, but in terms of heart rate and glucose, but I'll talk about heart rate. Um, I've never used heart rate to monitor my effort levels before in a race. Um, occasionally in training, just to like reset in my mind what my easy pace is and make sure my easy pace is indeed easy. So during further though, we have, we're wearing the Coros armbands and the screen that I had set to on my watch was pace and heart rate. Um, so my goal largely was to keep my pace between like 930 pace and 1030 pace on these loops um, and keep my heart rate below 140 at all times. Um, so on day one, this was obviously quite easy. I think my heart rate was like 125 to 130 running like nine something pace. Um, but what was just astonishing for me was the fact that these same paces were staying under 140 throughout the event. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with me not overreaching on day one, despite like 930. I think I came in the, on the first couple loops and told Mike, like, it's really hard to run 10 minute pace right now. And he's like, well, just do what's easy and like your body will figure it out. But like, yeah, by day six, I was like, oh, the 10 minute pace is pretty hard to hold right now. <laughs> but I would use but that the- largely. Like anytime I saw it go slightly higher, I would like, just be like, calm down, like keep it, keep it chill. Like you don't need to be running fast right now, fast. But one thing that was, that amazed me was that even on like day four, day five, day six, you were able to still, you still had the choice to go 10 minute pace or not. Mm-hmm. Like that was one thing that like, I mean, I, I definitely was never going to say this out loud before the race, but like when we were making the schedule, I was like, well, Leah still has 10 minute pace written down on day six. Like the pace is the same. I'm like, there's no way this is going to happen. Cause I figured there would have been so much more muscular breakdown that you would have been like, you know, zombie shuffling 12 to 14 minute pace by the end of the race and that you would just be spending more time out there but then you like still had the like elasticity and the range of motion to still be clipping like 10 some of your fastest laps were in the middle of the night on like day four and day five and like all of us like when we like i mean yeah we had the greatest spreadsheet ever um but like when we would click you in and out for laps we were like dude, she hasn't run a lap that fast since 200 miles ago. Like it was, that was one of the most um, like interesting bits of like all of further was for speed. Yeah. And just like seeing how you didn't slow down when you were out on the laps, like some, like some of the rests got closer together and took a little bit longer, but like your most efficient running pace did end up staying like 10 minute pace the whole time whole time. Like I'm looking at our spreadsheet and miles 348 through 353, I ran 948, 951 pace for those laps, which is crazy. Yeah. And I would say that is something that's like, I mean, I know there's been some complaints about like how the event itself wasn't really (laughs) catered to the ultra running world. Like there wasn't a live stream. The tracker was lacking at times. And that was something I would have loved to see on a tracker is like time in and time out of aid station. Because mm-hmm. like from my standpoint, like I was spending a decent amount of time in the aid station to take care of myself. But when I was out actively lapping the course, I was moving very efficiently the whole time, like similar paces on day six that I was on day one, which is really cool for me to mm-hmm. see. And I think from an ego standpoint, it would have been really cool for the general public to see as well. But yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, you, you had you had an experience right around with the wearable or technology stuff. Yeah, I was gonna say we got to go back to that. Um, yeah. There was, I mean, there was a couple different ones, but so with the ingestible core temperature pills, which was like a daily thing. Um, I don't know, it was like the size of a normal pill that like tracked your core temp and transmitted all the data via Bluetooth to Leah's phone, as well as like the tablets that the research teams had. And I don't know how much they were actively planning on like sharing or using this data during the race. But at one point during, I don't know if it was one of the days or one of the nights, the team came in, there was like three of them and they were like, okay, look at Leah's core temperature data. And they were like, look at how, um, they were like, why are there these dips? Like every 26 minutes and 30 seconds. They're like, it goes up and then it comes down by like, 
it is in Celsius. It was like, it came down by like a full degree every minute. And I was like, guys, those are her laps. Like she's actively like one thing that Leah did perhaps probably the best of anyone out there is uh topical cooling. Um, so like ice water staying cold, like Leah was taking on ice any pretty much like a lot of ice during the day. And in a little bit of ice, even at night, like pretty much any time it was over probably 55 degrees, you were taking on a little, I mean, like there is like, I remember like day five, you're like, can I just have five ice cubes, please? <laughs> like very specific, like five <laughs> ice cubes. Um, but that was important because we were seeing real time data of how effective the topical cooling was with Leah's core temperature, how it would like come up a little bit when she was like middle of the lap, come in, do some cooling, and then it would come down and stay down for like the first half of the lap every single time. And they didn't know to the extent, you know, Leah was cooling. So I got to like explain to them, I'm like, this is our cooling protocol that we're going through. Like we're using all the gear that Lulu has made specifically for this event for cooling because they know the scientific benefits of topical cooling. And then they got to see like in real time, like their theories, like be proven at least. And they were like, Oh my God, this is the coolest thing we've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, it shows how important context is. Like if they just see those numbers without that backstory, they're yeah. probably and we got to overlay it. it. We got to overlay it with Leah's spreadsheet, which like, we got to like I showed them. I was like, "Look at your numbers. Look at your timestamps. Look at our timestamps. They all match." And they were just like, "Oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing we've ever." They're like, "This made this made all of this worth it." Like day four of making people swallow thermometers, and they're like, "This is worth it. This is amazing." And and that happened. Um, that happened through most. Like we were using your continuous glucose monitor. Like me and Peter were breaking down your race, looking at your glucose levels and how basically like how much, uh, like how many calories your body was needing and consuming and how it was mostly carbohydrates that you were like demanding. Like there was one spot where, you know, typically, you know, like in the middle of the night, your glucose levels stay pretty steady. And then Leah started to tank and then I think Mike was saying, oh yeah. And then she got up at four and like pounded a bowl of oatmeal and went back to sleep. And usually that rises the glucose levels back up and then they stay steady again, but it went up and then just like right back down to like a lower, like almost like running type level homeostasis. And like the way Peter was interpreting that data was like, oh my God, her body was like, I need some carbs and I need it now. And like immediately used up all of that glycogen. Um, and like, we could see it just on the graphs. And then the second night when your stomach started to go south and, you know, it really like from a like digestive standpoint, seemed like you were at your worst. We then looked back at that data and your blood sugar was spiking all over the place. And then so you threw up and then it fixed and then it leveled out. So are you guys, are you guys believers in these wearable devices for like reliable, like, stuff that you can act on or it's it's tough like i think in an event of this duration it's quite useful actually mm -hmm. um i don't think for maybe like maybe the core temperature monitoring pill um for something like western states but at the same time it's like i think you use these tools to learn about yourself and to learn what works yes. that's always been my experience with wearables is I don't use them in my day-to-day -day life other than just like wearing my GPS watch to run um, because I'll even wear a heart rate strap like twice a year just to remind myself, okay, this is easy pace. So I think I learn a lot about myself through my wearables, but don't depend on them. And like the CGM, for example, it's quite delayed. So it's really hard to make any real time decisions based off of what you're seeing on the CGM itself. Um, core temperature monitoring pill, it seems like they had a little bit more real time data with that one. Yeah. But yeah, I don't I don't think for real time decision making it's the most useful. Yeah, I agree with that. Um like looking at the like if we if we look at this from the point of view of it was a really big training week uh and we were using it to collect data, mm -hmm. like 
moving forward, we now know like these types of carbohydrates at this interval rate keep your glucose levels the most steady. You don't need to monitor that again during that array, like during a race. Like now you know. Got it. Yeah. Or like, you know, we now know like when you cool in this way, this frequently, your core temp stays in a place that it should be. Yeah. Something I thought that was really unique and cool about this event, um, and I know some of the six day purists would disagree, is the two and a half mile nature of the loop. At least for me, this was always between 24 and 30 minutes per lap, let's say. That's a pretty regular eating interval for any normal ultra. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. for example, I'd be taking in like 150 calorie gel, um, maybe a 40 grams of carb gel every lap, which would then put me around like 80 carbs, 70 to 80 carbs in an hour for the entire race. So it allowed for me to be quite standardized with how I was treating my nutrition. And the same with like caffeine, like a caffeinated gel then. I'd be like, okay, maybe like four laps, after four laps or after six laps, I'll take a caffeinated gel and I'll take a salt tab. Um, So I found that like, I think people in the six day world like to see like shorter distance loops. So you don't have to carry anything with you. I was oftentimes having at least like one gel on me and I carried a handheld um, like 350 milliliter bottle the entire time. Um, But I, I found it quite nice because it took a lot of the thinking of time out of it for me. So in a normal 100 miler like Western States or UTMB, the screen that I have up on my watch is just time, total elapsed time. And I just look down every 20, 25 minutes and I eat something. Um, this was nice because then I could focus more on like pace and heart rate um, because it was a flat course and these loops were taking me always the same the same amount of time. Leah, could you speak a little bit on what you learned over the first few days of like your nutrition in regards to like electrolyte consumption? Mm, mm. Yeah. Uh, I always stand by the fact that like I, my nutrition plan has evolved so much over the years and like you don't, I don't need to fix it in my opinion. That's always been my opinion, especially the last couple of years because it's worked extremely well for me. Um, I was wrong and there's so much I can learn. And one of the most apparent things for me, at least in this event was just my over electrolyte consumption historically. And maybe it's not even an over electrolyte consumption necessarily. Um, Maybe more so this idea that there's multiple approaches you can take that can be successful. And the approach that I took it further um, on days one to two, where like, I would say like my historical approach, which is rotating electrolyte drink and water, um, always picking a gel in that has electrolytes in it, and then supplementing with a salt tab every few hours. Um, That's a lot of salt, a lot of sodium. Yeah, probably like... I don't yeah. know, like 700 to 1,000 milligrams an hour. Yeah. It was and probably about what you were doing. Yeah, I'm a salty sweater. And I've also experienced a lot of like GI issues and races in the past um, due to electrolyte imbalance, I'm pretty sure. Um, so on day two into three, I was feeling like very fluid filled and just like retaining a lot of fluid and just trying to like troubleshoot in my brain. Like, Mm. why could this be happening? And then I was like, okay, team, let's go to a, like, strip my nutrition plan down and do gels that don't have any electrolytes in them and just keep my gels basic. Let's go to straight water. And then let's just use a salt tab as my only, like, electrolyte consumption then um, when I'm out on course. That way I can be a little bit more in control of the exact sodium intake that I'm having. And my nutrition has never been better. Like, I kid you not, like, flawless nutrition from – day three through day. I mean, it was actually pretty good day one through day six, aside from Mm -hmm. like my first ever ultra induced vomiting, which I'm proud of, but I can't (laughs) believe I haven't thrown up yet. (laughs) I hated it in the moment, but it worked amazing. So I know Jason Coop has uh, talked a little bit about like, maybe we are just over all over salting and we're all just dehydrated and we just need to drink more water. And uh, like, I'm a naysayer usually, but I, I think I do lean into that idea a little bit more after this and had my whole nutrition plan like completely revamped in my head over the course of six days, which was pretty cool. And you would scale this down to shorter events in the future? I think so. Yeah. I 100% think so. And like, I mean, one of the other amazing things too is that like you were able, you were 
I mean, you were the only one basically eating gels beyond day four because, um, you know, one of the cool parts about, you know, this further event and being very well supported was um, for those who are familiar with like the website, The Feed, we basically had like a real life version of that right behind the crew pit stop where they had shelves of 20 different brands of nutrition products, like anything that the athletes thought they might want, they had it at the ready. And I mean, I became best friends with the people working over there in the sports science. Cause I was like walking over and they're like, Leah needs more gels, huh? And I'm like, yep. Can I get like this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. They're like, this is, the, and they were blown away by how often I kept coming by to re up on fuel and gels. Cause they were like, no, I was, and then they eventually, they were just like, do you just want the box? And I was like, are, are you good? Like, do, does it, uh, people need, and they're like, bro, you're the only one who's been here in like 24 hours. Like, <laughs> and, and like, I don't know. Yeah. Like what do you attribute to like your ability to continue to just like take 80 grams of carbs an hour of gels for six days? It's crazy. That's, that's crazy. Even thinking about, um, I think it has to do with keeping heart rate in mind, keeping my core temp low, keeping mm -hmm. my pace low from the start. So I was never overexerting my digestive system. Um, and then I thought it was extremely valuable to take those big in-between sessions to really fuel up on things that weren't gels. So like, I think I mentioned early on my like in-between session was five to seven pierogies, a cup of smoothie, and then a goo roctane protein shake. So probably a good like 500 calories right there. Um, to just like reload up my carb stores. That way, when I was out there, I could just get that immediate sugar right into my system rather than needing anything else substantial. Like mm. that was shocking. So I do think keeping your body fueled from the very start and continuing that nonstop is always important. Like you can't miss one of those 25 minute periods because like, then you just start putting yourself in this deficit that's hard to come back from. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So, that was the other thing that ended up being really fascinating was maybe around day three, instead of like us bringing you food and being like, do you want this? Like, like, tr like real food when you're resting, you were like, would come and you were like, I am hungry. I need a protein shake and five pierogies stat. We were like, wow. Like, <laughs> like the, the furnace is just burning so hot where you're like next lap I'm coming in. And like, you know, you're coming, you're sitting down, you're like, I am so hungry right now. Like, I am so hungry. Oh, I was so hungry. It was, it was very fascinating just how the, this, like your stomach, um, like morphed over the course of the first, like two, three days, um, to, yeah, like essentially like no, like fueling never became a chore in like the negative <laughs> way. It was always like, am I able to give myself the amount of calories that my body needs. Not like, yeah. Oh, I got to take this gel again. And you're just like, body needs it. Like yeah, give the, it tank, to it. the tank yeah. needs some gas. Yeah. If you had to rank order like the top three biggest limiters, what would they be and why for the event? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> body, like despite, like, I, I do think my training was sufficient for this event, but like, random medical things that would crop up that were kind of scary that you didn't understand entirely because you've never pushed your body this far yeah. and just not knowing how much time to dedicate to said issue or like what the protocol should be coming out of said issue. That was extremely time consuming. So um, on day four, I ended up having a 10 mile day. I tried to get out and initially I was having a really hard time with temperature regulation um, was getting just extremely cold despite it being 80 degrees. Um, so I gave myself some time in our tent just to get dry, recalibrate, eat some food and like reset. Um, also the, that was one of the days that I was having like a lot of fluid retention and was just feeling like things were off. And then finally I motivated myself to get back out there, got back out there. And then I started to have chest pain, which like any amount of chest pain is pretty scary. Um, so I saw medical, I got an EKG run on myself and explain my symptoms. And they're like, I'm pretty sure like you're okay. It's probably just some sore intercostal muscles. Um, so then I ended up being like, okay, let's just like give myself a good night's sleep to reset all of this. Spent some time with my crew that night. Unfortunately, Brett was not part of 
the daytime crew that day. So Brennan <laughs> I was, was asleep, sleeping all day. <laughs> but this just being having to take that full day reset in that moment was extremely disappointing. But it was also in line with my values and what I told myself coming into the event was like, I'm not going to do anything that's going to risk my health. Um, mm. And I, I want to get the most out of myself here, yes. But if there's anything that's alarming, I'm going to give it the requisite time that I need. And for me, that's that was meaningful in that moment. Um, so then I did go out the next day, still had some intercostal muscle soreness, which I was then able to troubleshoot by um, taping my boobs down. I think it ended up being more of like a just general soreness from like just movement over days, which is why it's so important to study women like this. It was making breathing laborious and like impossible and painful. And I was just working with Emily Krauss, um, one of the physicians on the medical team about what this could be. And we started just like taping me down in various ways to like almost like correct my posture and give me more support, um, which ended up solving my issues. So at the end of the day, it wasn't even a heart related issue. It was more like muscular and postural than anything, but it's like an issue I would have never figured out or troubleshooted, sh troubleshot if it weren't for six days of running. Intercostal muscle pain is an interesting one. Like that would be something that I would have guessed was super, unless you had some on, you know, ongoing issue coming into like a 50 or hundred mile event, it becomes unique to the multi-day experience. Totally. And it's like, I'm very happy I was able to get an EKG run on me and it was totally clear and things like that, but your mind just spirals. Um, so I think just the random medical stuff that would pop up and be time consuming, like taking care of blisters, taping a pesky knee, things like that. Like that was a limiter. Um, I actually don't think sleep was limiting whatsoever. Um, perhaps I would have a different opinion if I was chasing, like very much like chasing records here as well. Um, I think I got the most out of myself given what my body was giving me for the week. Um, but yeah, sleep, I think, is entirely manageable in a scenario like six day races. How about foot care? Yeah. After day, after getting them treated on day one, like keeping my toes taped for the rest of the week, I think I had one blister pop up after wow. I got them treated on day one. So that was extremely important, an important lesson for me for future and like fit for you, like going into Cocodona is just totally. like treating things early so they don't become problems later on because mm. Our crew was treating our my blisters on day one and no offense to my crew, but like having actual medical professionals like do exactly what you're supposed to do for blisters was a game changer because I had no, my toes were perfect after that. Yeah. And once they gave us, I mean, they, they did finally give us a, a scalpel just for our, our <laughs> own crew to use. Cause I mean, <laughs> Leah, what did you pop your first blisters with on day one? A staple. How gnar oh is that? <laughs> Leah's stabbing her feet with a staple because uh, it was either that or like clipping skin with toenail clippers. And then they were like, guys, I think we're just going to give you a scalpel. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Finn, tape your toes. Okay. Yeah. Tape your toes with like, what do we do? Like KT Tate touching your toes and then like a roll of like that, like moleskin type tape to keep yeah, it anchored like down adhesive to keep the tape down, which was really important. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, uh, tape. like shockingly, this was, I think it has to do with the terrain being so like relatively level the whole time. Um, the bottoms of my feet were spectacular. No blisters whatsoever. It was all, all my toes. Hmm. Um, yeah, there's a good book out there called Fixing Your Feet, which I'm starting to read right now. We'll link to it in the show notes. It kind of touches on everything you guys just said. It's a good one. Um, Brett, I'm sure that the crossover conversational pace listeners out there would love to hear you geek out on uh, some of the shoe tech, apparel tech, people that you got to talk with over the week. What are some of the insights, observations, conversations that stuck out to you? So I like the the... the the overarching like uh, i don't know thing that i've got like take away from this whole thing is like i am i'm buying lululemon shoe stock now <laughs> like getting to hang out with their team of developers and researchers over a week um you know i think the first round 
of like the road shoe, the trail shoe that came out last year. Um, admittedly, probably just a little bit rushed to you know get something on the market to parallel with the announcement of the team. Second generation of the shoes, like so much better. There's been so much more research uh, and like just miles of testing, materials testing. If there's anything that I've always known about Lulu, it's that they, I mean, they have the best apparel, like just materials in the game. And um, they're not afraid to reinvent the wheel and actually have it be better than it was before. I I was talking to uh, Peter Tierney, who is, what, what is Peter's official position at Lulu? Like, Peter's do, uh, official position at Lululemon is um, like research. Uh, he's like a senior researcher on the product innovation and advanced concepts team. Yeah. So like innovation and advanced concepts, like that was part of, I was like, that's cool. Let me hear more about that. And then he was like, okay, we reinvented Velcro. And I was like, oh, that's something that no one's thought about for 60 years because it's always been good enough. And then he was like, yeah, no, from Lulu's point of view, like it's actually crap. And then he showed me like the Velcro that's on the ice bandanas and how it's soft on both sides, but equally is like grippy and it worked perfectly and it was amazing. And then, you know, they have, they, they reinvented the zipper that you can just like rip it open if you need to. And I was like, why, like who, I would have never thought that the zipper needed to be made any better. And then they did. When they take that kind of creativity and apply that to footwear, they are going to make some phenomenal shoes. And one of the things that I was talking to Peter and and, and Jordan about, who's, all, who's like one of the head footwear developers was the fact that all 10 women were able to wear, you know, one of the three different shoe mothers, the, the Bliss Feel Trail, mm -hmm. the Beyond Feel, and then a, a prototype for, I think, set for next year. They were, you know, wearing one of those three pairs of shoes for all six days, every single one of them, and no, like, no major injuries popped up. Um, mm -hmm. No one ever got to the point where it was like, oh, I got to throw on, you know, I got to throw on like a Saucony Endorphin Speed and just tape over the logo. Like I'm sure had it come to that, they would have allowed that to happen. Be like, you just got to like tape over the shoe, but it like never even, it was never even close. And I was like, the fact that they could have something that dialed in for such a wide variety of feet is very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. That was, to be honest, like that was shocking to me. Like I, I don't know a ton about shoes, but like I know what I'm comfortable in and I know what I'm not comfortable in. And, um, I had been targeting one of either the prototype or the beyond feel um, for all of further. And I think what was extremely cool and rewarding for me was to like have my mind changed mid event for like what I expected. Like I was telling myself the whole time going into the event, like, Oh, I'm only going to wear the prototype. Like that's the shoe I like better when I've been training around here in Salt Lake. Um, and then in like 20 miles, I'm like, oh, I think I need a shoe change. Like this is why I just need like a new sensation. And then um, I think I tell my crew, like, get Jordan in here. I need to talk to Jordan. And like in seconds, Jordan, like the head of their footwear team is in my crew tent talking me through shoe options and like what each different shoe gives me. And that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So then I switched over to Beyond Feel and wore the Beyond Feel, I think, until day six, probably, uh, when I wanted another new sensation under my foot, just like a different change. So that, I, that was shocking to me because I had like rolled out the Beyond Feel in my mind because like... I had just liked the prototype shoe a lot better personally. Um, but then I ended up falling in love with beyond feel at mile 300. And I could have never told you that. That the, yeah. the, the, the interest in multi sensation in a multi-day environment is interesting to me. Cause I would, before this conversation, I would have thought like, you just want this like super plush shoe mm -hmm. for the entirety of six days. But it sounds like you, Maybe it sometimes wanted a more responsive shoe, sometimes a more plush shoe. That's that's really right. interesting. And because like the train out there was like three quarters of a mile on pavement into dirt trail. So it's like one shoe, you might have liked one shoe better on different surfaces. Um, and I think that's the point that I got to where is like just wanting to, I think my my uh, tendons were feeling some stress at some point. So it's like, I just wanted stability um, and more of like that feeling the ground. And that's what I got with the Beyond Feel, which was awesome. Sweet. Yeah. And I guess the other thing too is like, so like Camille Heron, she's a big sneakerhead. Like 
she's very particular about her shoes and like we've chatted about her her shoe choice and some of her favorite shoes from back in the day and um you know she's always optimizing footwear performance and she wore the same shoes as the other you know the nine other competitors at further and set a gazillion world records Mm -hmm. in in the same shoes and she loved them and had no foot issues so and that's you know we're really only into like this is like year one of lulu having like a full footwear team and like full year of athlete feedback and um you know they have the resources to be able to back that up um they just need to like roll out and scale it appropriately but uh if i were other brands i'd be scared (laughs) um I'm looking at my list here. Any other topics we should definitely cover before we get into some closing stuff? Um, oh, one story that I just thought was really cool that was going back to like the scientific testing as well as the gear testing was the um, when you Leah when you were having like a lot of like the chest pain. I don't know if it was like day four or day five, but then uh, like going through the the biomechanics tent on the other side and getting real time feedback. Um, yes that they noticed like yeah i'll let you tell that story because i just thought that was really cool this was so cool so finn on day three i think it was is when i started to have like my chest or day four i had my chest pain issues and then after a couple laps i was like okay i think like just taping myself down pretty good will like help solve this and like correct my posture and then on day five devin and i were just like cracking up about this scenario because like on day four We were like, oh my gosh, we think we're going to recover so well out of this. We feel amazing right now. Nothing hurts. Everything's great. And then I think it was on day five that like every little issue we had experienced every single day just like came cropping back up and exploding in our faces. And I bumped into her and she's like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to recover so great from this. I was like, me either. So it's funny how over the course of six days, like some things are little, they go away, but then at times they all explode back in your face. Um, But my chest pain was one of the ones that did resurface, I think on day five, after I had thought I had solved it. Um, so I was really exacerbated and frustrated out there on a loop. I was like having to walk because I couldn't take in a deep breath. So I get, we we went through this, um, biomechanics tent on every single loop, um, where we crossed across to cross, um, force sensing plates in the ground. And I stopped right outside the tent and I was like, have you guys noticed anything wonky about my biomechanics? I was like, I'm having a lot of chest pain. I think it's posture related. And they're like, we can't give you any, we can't see anything right now at the moment, but we can like look at your data and you could check in with us in this next lap. And I was like, yeah, anything that you just put eyes on that you could tell me. And the one researcher out there said, you're, you look down the whole time when you run. And she's like, how about this lap? You try to like over-exaggerate looking up and see if that changes how your posture is. Wow. And it clicked in my mind. I was like, she's right. I've been doing 80% of my running at night with a headlamp on out here. And I'm just looking down, like chugging along and I'm probably just hunched over stressing out my intercostal muscles. So like, I need to actually like stand up and open this up. I did that. My next lap chest pain was gone. And I'm like, Holy crap. I just got like real time biomechanics feedback. And like, granted it was probably something pretty basic, but only something that somebody that's staring at me lap after lap is observing about me is just like my head is constantly looking down. So I thought that was extremely informative and like, extremely unique to this experience yeah that was super cool it's like you're, you're not getting that anywhere else unless you have like a biomechanics research team um which yeah like the, I, I would have loved to get out on that section of the course and just see all of uh the, the the gear that they had set up but i mean like it sounded like jordan was giving me the run through of it where it was like you had like what like 10 meters worth of force plates that mm-hmm. you ran over every single lap so they got like foot strike data cadence data you know, left, right balances, um, you know, that gives you then like vertical oscillation, but then they also had slow motion cameras set up in the tent as well. That was capturing your whole body to see how you're like, do you start twisting more? How are your arms doing? And, you know, back in the day it was, you had to run on a treadmill and they would put that like morph suit on you with all those little dots attached. And then you could see on the computer, like your little skeleton version of you shows up they have the machines to be able to do that without having to be on a treadmill and they don't have to put all the dots on you. Like all Leah had to do was run through that section of cameras and then like full like skeleton Leah would show up 
Um, and I mean, gosh, they have so many miles worth of data. What what did what was the collective mileage from all ten women? Mm. Like twenty eight hundred or three thousand like miles that. or yeah. something like that. Like that's a lot of miles worth of data from footwear, biomechanics, um, all over the course of you know like one thing. And and they had uh, 3D foot scanners uh, right behind the crew. Uh, pit stops so like all the athletes like once a day were getting their feet scanned and it was like a pressure mat as well as like full 3d scanning Um, that would take like very precise measurements just because they wanted to see how the feet changed over the course of the six days because that could just influence the way that they change something with the shoes they're like we're not sure what we're going to come from this but like we might find something that is like it creates an aha moment for like oh we need to change this about the tongue or Mm -hmm. the heel cup because every single person started to, you know, we saw this in the data. Um, And that was just like another unique thing that like, you're only going to get from a six day race in a, in a very controlled environment. You know, I think that's one of the questions that a lot of people asked me was like, why is this seem like, why does this, why is this event so closed off? And like, why is it only 10 people? And it's like, yeah, you could have a hundred or 200 people, but you can't gather that that kind of data so uh like you can't get that kind of quality of data from that many people or you could get a huge amount of data sets from 10 people totally yeah that's a great point that i wouldn't mind segueing into uh, is like mike and i have been chatting a lot about this because like there are some critical eyes on the event itself um feeling like you know this event wasn't ultra specific. It wasn't trail running specific. So like, why is it being marketed as, as such? And um, Mike, actually, he responded to something on LinkedIn today with a pretty insightful response that I agree with, and I'll share with you guys. Um, and he said, if any ultra runners or trail runners are upset or critical about the further event, it seems to be because they feel like the event was made or was supposed, supposed to have been made for ultra and trail runners, but it wasn't. The event was made for women, for research, a lot of it, and for anyone who could find inspiration in the stories that unfolded. And of course, as a marketing activation for the shoes, it wasn't made by ultra runners. Would we ultra runners have liked it better if it had been in some ways, of course, but let's be real. Lululemon is looking at a much bigger picture than the niche little sport of ultra running. And I feel like that really captures the event as a whole. Like, do I think there were elements of the event that could have been more influenced by ultra running, like having a live stream, having a, improved tracker, having it be mm. open to the public. Of course I do. As an ultra runner, of course I do. But I don't think that was necessarily the mission of it. Um, I think Dylan Bowman wrote a really nice article on free trail today that yeah. said like further was just this like conglomeration of like golden hour moments. And mm-hmm. I couldn't relate more with that. I think it was, I think we saw records like Camille set in, in the process as well. Um, but at the same time, I think the research that we're going to glean out of the event, in addition to just like all those little moments were exceptional along the way. And I think pretty special. Yeah. I don't, I think a lot of people don't realize how science backed and research based a company like Lululemon is. Um, like I think on the surface, they look like this massive apparel company, but the amount of like studies that they've helped fund over in Vancouver, like with their labs and stuff uh, has progressed. I mean, many different sports in a lot of different ways. And like, that's partly also why, like, you know, if you buy some of their clothes and it's like, why does this fit so well? It's like, because they have put so many dollars worth of research and development into making sure like from a performance standpoint, it is great. And, um, you know, I think that's, I think that's just something that a lot of people don't maybe didn't expect out of a company that big where it's like, if you didn't know like the history of Lululemon, it's like, no, they actually, they're, they've got a lot of, they, a lot of, a lot of nerds over there that love science and it's, totally. and I it's think amazing. Too, like just their collaboration with the Canadian sport Institute um, with Trent Stellingworth. I mean, he's one of the most cited electrophysio electro, uh, sorry, not electrophysiologist, my work. Um, exercise physiology researchers um in the field and like having him out there for the entirety of the event in addition to like people that had worked on like nike's breaking two project like pat jeffers um and then one of the lead designers at lululemon yuki ahara um just these bright minds who spent 
years and years working on like very similar marketing activations and brand activations and working in advanced concepts. It's just this, the minds that came together for this to support a really cool vision. Uh, it was just a, like such a privilege to be part of. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And there was a lot of comments of like, oh, this is so over the top, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's the whole point. The whole point is to like maximize the amount of support that these 10 women get over the course of the race. They're like, their whole goal was to leave no stone unturned. So when people are like, oh, they have this and that, it's like, yeah, of course they do. That's the point. Like we wanted to see what would happen if there was a six day event where everyone was fully supported in these sorts of ways. It's like, I understand what you're saying. And yes, it is supposed to be like that because this is a very unique experience probably a once in a lifetime sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So yes, of course it makes sense to go all out then for something like this. I also, the, the one thing I would add to that, just having watched it over the internet, I think, I think a lot of events in our sport do this pretty well. Like Western States does it very well. A lot of Aravipe events do it well. UTMB has done it well. I think anytime you set out to create an event or like in further's case, like a whole social media product, internet product, you should set out to create a feeling like you should generate a feeling in the people that are consuming that experience. I think the vast majority consumed this and like were inspired and, you know, they became invested in the mission and they were excited to see Camille make history and Leah, just you persisting as well as you did throughout the entire six days. I think it created a feeling of unity towards those things. Um, but yeah, I think like you need to create a story. You kind of need to be a little bit over the top to begin with, but that's just what you do to bring in a lot of people. So um, I think marketers understand. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was the same way with breaking too. Like they had like a Tesla with a giant timing board on it because they knew that would cut the wind down. And then they were doing like wind tunnel testing with pacers to make a flying V formation to, allow Kipchoge to run the fastest time with the least amount or the fastest pace with the least amount of wind resistance. I'm like, that's the kind of extra that we need. Like that's the kind of extra that Lulu was able to put into further. Like it's, yeah, it was, it was awesome. When does Le uh, Leah or Brett, when does the research become publicly available? Do you know? Um, I think, I think it was their goal is to start publishing by this fall. Um, yeah, that's I, what I heard too. Personally, I will get access to all of my data quite soon, which will be yeah. really, really exciting to look through because we did like blood draws pre and post event. We did urine samples um, throughout the course of the event. Um, yeah, as all the CGM, aura data, just yeah, so much. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so insightful. And like, I don't know how much it'll inform for me. Like, maybe it's a lot of what I already knew, but I think I'm going to like, gain something from this um in a lot of ways all right so in recent history we've had breaking two we've had project carbon x2 we just had further and before this episode i was thinking like what if there was ever another one either from lulu or some other brand what would it look like what could it look like um and leo we, we talked about this offline but like one yeah. of the questions i asked you was would you prefer in the future to, to chase a distance or again, to go after kind of a set number of days. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to get your answer. Cause like, as I was observing the whole thing go down, I feel like when you have a set number of days, that whole like central governor effect, it forces you to meter out your effort even more than you would a certain distance. So curious to get your take there. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I will say, I'll preface this by saying before further, I never considered going much beyond a hundred mile events and or doing like a 24 hour event on the track for example like my mind has been entirely changed and those are both some things that would interest me in the future i think because this gave me so much perspective for time and distance and things like that um i kind of liked the timed event to be honest i thought it was an interesting challenge um interesting to plan for and get the most out of yourself um i like that a little bit I would like that as a challenge a little bit more than a specific distance, for example. Mm. It's like, it's fun for like my thinking and planning and science mind a little bit. Yeah. Because you, you have like 
you have like a constant start and finish. Like you can't finish six days earlier. So then it's like, what do you do within this timeline? But like, I think it was me and Mike were talking maybe around the end. We're like, so Leo went like, you went 500, how many miles did you go? 400. 400 miles. 400 miles. Uh, If you had known that this race was going to be 400 miles long, do you think it would have taken like the same amount of time or Mm. less or more? I think less. I think it would have taken like Like, five days or four days. Or or like, what would that have done? um, Like from a stress standpoint, because you knew that like, I have six days, like I can sleep, I can do this. Did that then allow you to run your best miles out there? Whereas like, if it's five, 400 miles and you're like, I'm going to sleep, you're like, I am not getting any closer to the end right now. Like, yeah, just, we, were, we were curious about like how, how, the, how the mind game um, changes on a timed versus distance-based race like that. Uh, yeah, it forced me to think about, I think with time, I thought about future Leah way more than I would have if it was a distance. Like on day mm-hmm. one and two, every movement and decision I made was based on Leah on day five and day six. And I would love to take that element out of it. That's why I would be like more inspired by like a 48 hour at this point than anything longer than that, 24 or 48 hour, because you don't really have to think about future Leah too much. But I think, yeah, there was a lot of decision-making going on that was in self-preservation mode more than anything. How about how this impacts the rest of your 2024 schedule? Obviously, like you're, you're in the prime of your career right now. Western States, UTMB, run rabbit races like that are super important. Does this change anything for the rest of the year? I mean, you're feeling great now, so I think we're, we're curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how recovery will keep going. Um, this is the best I've felt post-event like this. I can't even say event like this, like post-100-mile type effort. Um, I think what will be interesting is like keeping any like little tendon niggles at bay. I think muscularly, like I feel like I ran less than a 50. I like, I don't feel anything, which is good. Um, but I think it's more like tendons, which tend to be more hindering come events, um, that crop up. So I'm going to keep an eye on that stuff, but like fatigue wise, I feel pretty great. Um, don't feel like anything terribly deep fatigue, my like resting heart rates almost back to normal. Um, which is exciting. And I do think a lot of that has to do with just like quality, like nutrition and pacing and like never overexerting myself during the event. Um, but my plan right now for the rest of the season is quad rock in May, Western States, and then uh, run rabbit in September. But I'm also not tied to any of my races and very much open to pivoting if I need to, because nothing's worse than forcing a long race when your body's not there. So I'm going to yeah. just keep it open-ended and just be smart. Awesome. Um, let's do final takeaways. Brett, I know we covered a lot in this episode. Any other sound bites from the six days that were that you want to kind of remind listeners of or speak to? It was, I mean, it was an amazing experience. I'm kind of like, selfishly kind of hoping once in a lifetime sort of thing. Like, Leah, you're not trying to like better this in the like near future, are you? Somebody did write okay. on my Facebook wall saying like maybe you you made the six day like national team. I'm like, there's a six day national team. No, there is not. Is there? Really? Oh my gosh. So yeah, Brad. Would you represent Team yeah. USA at a six day event like this fall? <laughs> no. Um, Fifty. Yeah, it was really cool. It was, you know, I never I never thought I would crew anyone for a six day race, uh, didn't know what that would be like. It was, it was really cool to see like just how that unfolded. And I think the big, the most fascinating thing to me was, it was more the mental side and the more mental game than the physical side. And even just like, you know, where you can find motivation, even when you might not win the whole thing. Like, you know, there was a time when Camille was like, you know, 175 miles up on you but you were still like clicking off laps as if she was 20 meters ahead of you and that's not coming from a place of you know i can still win the race because there was a point where mike and i were doing 
<laughs> math on like day five. And we were like, if Camille stops now, Leah needs to run a 16 hour, 100 mile, and then 20 more miles to win. Where she is fine. She's pulling motivation from somewhere else. Yeah. And that, that was so fascinating to us that you were able to continue to, to do something up there to to keep going um whether that was i mean you were very fascinated with the science of what like you were like every every other lap you were like bodies are incredible guys like <laughs> bodies are so so amazing and and yeah i think if continuing to go into that unknown just to like for the sake of science and it's like you are contributing to studies that are going to further you know like women's sport um was was really cool to see and you know i think just such a unique experience and i think there's going to be a lot of really positive uh bits and pieces of you know data and studies that come from this whole experience really i've got three uh the first leah you and brett have convinced me that you can do multi-day in a healthy way and you can kind of come out the other side still loving the sport and still having a remainder of the season to be excited about. My second one is that, you know, at a lot of these races, you know, a lot of, a lot of athletes, coaches will show up and be on the sidelines at aid stations in there for support. That's kind of a standard. Now, I think after this further event, after these kind of pit crew experiences, we're going to see a lot more top athletes, uh, call up and recruit these like super niche specialized, like scientists like the biomechanics experts to help them make these maybe small one to two percent type decisions but you know at uh at forest hill stuff like that being there for them i think we could maybe see that in the future and then you know my last one i am not sure that anyone has ever gone to the well like camille heron did at this event in any ultra ever uh, she recently posted on ig the toll it took and um you know what she did was amazing i think it I hope it gets celebrated. I also hope that at a human level, she she bounces back and, and keeps doing this for a while because I think it, it appears that it took a lot out of her. So um, yeah, I'm sure she'll be on podcasts in the future to kind of provide more light on on what went down, but it was amazing. And it was also like, wow, like it took a lot. So mm-hmm. those are my three. Totally. Yeah. What, what Camille did was just inspiring and mind blowing to witness in person. Um, yeah, it's it takes a special human and like Camille is special and she's very good at what she does. So being able to see that in action was very impressive and oof, could not do it myself. So props to Camille. Um, I think something you brought up, Finn, in a little bit here is like somebody had posted earlier today on social media and it really resonated with me is that further as a reminder that like two opposing things can be true at once. It's possible to hate running and love running all at the same time. And both (laughs) of those things can be motivators to keep going. And I think that just fully and wholly described my whole further experience is like the number of times out there where like Devin and I would get together, we'd be like, fuck this, I'm ready to be done. And it was (laughs) only day three. And then come day five, we're like in tears, like this is the most special moment of our lives. Like the way you turn things around and like, just the way the human body can be resilient, resilient in moments of hardship, but then just like keep pushing through and like finding inspiration. Uh, that was a complete revelation for me out there that I don't think I would have gotten from any experience besides this six day event. So that was something I'm going to like take away and uh, be inspired by for a long time. <laughs>